Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duart. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday this week with Jill Stott. Hey, Jill, welcome back. Hey, Vasco. Thanks. It's good to see you again. Likewise, likewise. So today's Tuesday, of course, we'll talk about teams in a minute. But uh, before we go there, uh, what was the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master, Jill? Yes, that's an easy one for me. It's, um, I hope I'm saying her name right, Lisa Adkins, her book, Coaching Agile Teams. So uh, when I was a scrum master and then I was an aspiring agile coach and I had a mentor, she's like, everyone needs to read this. And it was so illuminating. You know, it, I'm assuming mo most people have read it. I highly recommend it for all scrum masters and um, to break down the different responsibilities of a scrum master, right? You've got the facilitation hat, the mentorship hat, the teaching hat, and uh, the a lot of real world examples that I use. And I read it, boy, I think it was like eight years ago. And I still use that as a reference. Like, oh, wait, let me see what Lisa Atkins. So that that's the book that I recommend. And I have so many books and a lot I still haven't read yet. Do you do collect books, Vasco, on Agile? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I, I, I know how that feels. Every time I move houses, it's a pain. <laughs> I bet, I bet. <laughs> Like, I'll read this someday. I'm sure it's really important. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Coaching Agile Teams, a book that uh, has been referenced here uh, quite often, which means that it's really a good book, mm. of course. And uh, you, you talked about the breaking uh, or breakdown of the different responsibilities for the Scrum Master as, as a key aspect that help you as a Scrum Master. Uh, but uh, as you moved on to agile coaching, which is uh, what you do mostly these days, um, what are the parts that you tend to go back to as an agile coach? Like, how are you using the book these days once you are now uh, acting more as an agile coach than a scrum master? So can we take a step back? Like, there's not, a, in my opinion, what, Vasco, what do you think the difference is between an agile coach and a scrum master? That, that's a question I would like you to answer. Oh, I want you to answer it. I don't think there's a lot of difference except for the title and maybe the reach. You know, as far as a scrum master might be working with one or two teams or an agile coach potentially could be working with the organization. But if you read the scrum guide, a scrum master isn't just responsible for working with a team. They're expected to uh, instill the agile mindset with the organization. So. I think it's just a, the, I think it's the same thing, but agile coaches get paid more <laughs> in general. <laughs> yeah, that, that is true. It, it kind of, I think that the industry has somehow settled on agile coach being a role that is senior to scrum master, even though uh, I would say that in terms of experience, it doesn't really matter. You can have very senior scrum masters and very junior agile coaches. True. Uh, I, myself, I make a, a, a distinction, if you will, um, between Scrum Master and Agile Coach, where the Scrum Master works w directly with the development, so directly with IT, maybe also with marketing and so on, but, but like with the delivery of something, the delivery of the product, and typically with one or two teams. So mostly individuals doing the work that ends up in the final product. And uh, how I define Agile Coaches is that they work with Scrum Masters, but they tend to work on... Um, a different level in the organization. So for example, I would expect agile coaches to be ready to host a workshop with leadership. Uh, oh. I'm pretty sure many scrum masters would do the same, but I would not necessarily ask that from a scrum master. I would ask a scrum master to be ready to host a workshop with a team or a group of teams and their product owners maybe, and their team leads and so on. But for example, if you want to transform a product management organization, I, I, my mind would go first to an Agile coach because uh, I expect the Agile coach to think about the aspects beyond the daily work, right? For example, uh, what do we do instead of product roadmaps? We're, we're just, as we record this, there's a, uh, the Agile Online Summit is going on and there's one talk, which is the death of product roadmaps. I think that's a beautiful mm -hmm. talk. I, I, I <laughs> saw it already and I think that it has great insights. 
but I wouldn't expect Agile coaches to necessarily worry about the existence or non-existence of roadmaps because they typically would work with a vision and a product backlog. But I would expect Agile coaches to think about what's the role of a roadmap in the whole process of product development here? What do you think about that? I think it's apt. I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll allow it. I, and you're right. There's so much of overlapping, but that's kind of what I, I agree where an agile coach has this larger uh, perspective potentially. And it would be nice if they had a lot of experience. Like you said, there's some really, uh, oh, sure. I'm an agile coach. I'll just put this title on. Um, and then working. And it's not just, Hey, can you do this it's the assumption is this agile coach could go in front of the C-level suite and do a training or do a difficult conversation uh, that's uncomfortable, which I've done too many times. Um, whereas <laughs> the scrum master, you know, it'd be they could do this, but that's not the expectation. So I think that's yeah. fair. Yeah, that's it. I think it's a, yeah. a little bit about those expectations for mm -hmm. sure. All right. And, and now we talk about teams and uh, teams, definitely. This is where Scrum Masters are expected to perform. Oh, yeah. And uh, the question is, uh, we want to hear a story, Jill, of a team that uh, on its own started to develop these patterns and behaviors that ultimately led to big problems in the team. So tell us that story. Okay. I and mean, like I said, I have a lot of these stories, but um, I'm, I'm thinking one that always comes to mind and I tell it quite a bit. So th this team, and like I said, we were all friends and we got along well and we were new to Scrum. <clears throat> it was a different team than the one I referred to earlier. And the chronic problem was, you've heard this before, but over committing every sprint, they would take on all these stories and then complete maybe a third of them at the most. And um, we had a, we'll call him Fred. There was one developer who was super smart and very opinionated. And we all kind of um, listened to Fred and said, okay, well, Fred said so. So his philosophy was, hey, we're going to take on as much as we think we can and we'll, we'll get done what we can get done. And he didn't see it as an issue at all. But the ramifications were, and I, I was seeing this from another perspective, was our poor product owner and our business analysts. They were so frustrated with the team. And I had a meeting with, uh, her name was Bonnie. She says, we never know what we're going to get. We are trying to tell our clients, this is when we'll have these new features out, but we have no idea. So there was a huge break in trust and it became pretty darn ugly, to, to, to be honest. Um, Can and, you give an example? Oh, well, a suitable so, for work example. <laughs> that's fair. It's a family show. It became very combative between IT and the the product ownership, and a lot of it was because of this unpredictability in, in the team. And um, so, what happened is they each reported to different senior vice presidents. So we had the product ownership team were going in there and literally bad mouthing. Here's the problem. And they're lazy and they're not doing their job right. And this and that and the other. Right. And then the, our IT group was probably doing this similar thing. And it just created a big division, not just within our team, but in the larger construct. And it went on for over a year until they finally said enough and reallocated and changed the teams um, for the better. So when I talked to our product owner and understood it from her perspective, it was like, oh, oh. And then having, it wasn't her because there was some bad blood, like I said, but another person came in with and explained to the team from the customer's perspective. Like it wasn't that... This is we want because we want it. It was this is their expectations and we're trying to plan ahead and very gently explain that from the customer's perspective. And that actually helped make things so much better. I mean, they were never perfect, but they weren't just saying, let's just commit to the whole world and get 1% done. Um, it, it, just having that understanding, that shared understanding. It didn't I think it's all a very elements. important uh, uh, like uh, perspective for the Scrum Master that, to build that shared understanding, right? Yes. Like we need yes. to create 
uh, whatever the dynamics might be, we need to create, if not acceptance, at least understanding of what are the dynamics in, in, in play in both sides in this case, meaning uh, POs and, and, and the team. But uh, uh, you talked about Fred having that phil philosophy of uh, let's just take everything we can, we want, and then we'll see what we can get done. What was the perspective of the team, though? Like, what, was the team kind of just stepping back and letting Fred make all the decisions? W what was team's expectations that uh, at least, if not accepted, they didn't in any case deny that behavior of taking in as much as possible for uh during or into right. one sprint well i'm not sure what the word for a fred type is but i mean we, we would have these discussions right um but it just i don't know if it was his charisma or his position but the other developers and the qa people tended to defer to fred uh not, not just in that example but when we were in sizing Fred would be like, that's eh, a three, that's easy. And we're like, okay, it's a three, because Fred said so. Um, and now looking back, and that was a while ago. That's odd. I should have, hmm. <laughs> you know, you look back, like, I could have done so much better. I could have done so much different. But he was a, he was a hard nut to crack. It, it, um, there's continued problems with Fred. And he was a genius. He would work all night, every night. And he would like introduce us new things no nobody asked for. And then last I heard, he's a team of one now. That's probably the best kind of team I for know, that's uh, not people like idea. Fred. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. He yeah, just yeah. didn't know how to work on a team. He was a nice guy. In per I mean, personally, we got along really well. And I think sometimes you have those special geniuses who may be better off as a team of one. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, when I asked that question, I, I expected that maybe there had been some reflection or conversation in the team. But if I understood you correctly, there wasn't. It was just an implicit acceptance implicit. that Fred knows best. Yes, that's true. Wow. And indeed, like for us as Scrum Masters, we should really pay attention to these dynamics. Like, for example, uh, don't necessarily force it to have people, you know, for example, size everybody at the same time with the poker cards or these days with uh, with Zoom chat or whatever. But uh, actually observe, like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. And and then we, we can ask ourselves, even if we don't ask the team, we can ask ourselves, why is Fred taking over? What is going on in these people's mind that, that accepts this as an okay behavior, right? Because uh, from, from my perspective, Scrum Masters work in the domain of collaboration, right? That's, we should be experts at generating the environment for collaboration, right? Because mm -hmm. that's, we work with teams, they need to collaborate. And uh, the dynamics that happen in this, uh, in this case, sprint planning sessions are very important because they are already a very clear insight into how the collaboration will go during the sprint, because I'm pretty sure people would come and ask Fred all kinds of questions all the time, right? Because if they are deferring to him in the sprint planning, they're probably deferring to him all throughout the uh, sprint, right? Yes, yes, yes. And they have one person make all the decisions, and one person is not as good as five people who are sharing ideas like, what about this? What about this? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and asking uh, asking the genius in the room is not the form of collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> what should we do, Fred? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> it's a form of reverse micromanagement. <laughs> right, I'll go right. ahead and let Fred micromanage me. <laughs> that is true. He did that. Oh, well, that's an interesting way to, to 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 phrase it, and that just kind of shows you how it's so hard to be a scrum master sometimes because of the human factors. You know, you can learn Scrum. It's not hard. It's eight pages and do the facilitation, but it's that people stuff and people are hard. One of my sayings I say all the time, Agile's easy. People are hard. So when you find a good Scrum master who knows how to work with people, hang on to them, keep them, promote them, pay them lots of money. Absolutely. Great advice. Thank you for sharing that, Jill. Tuesday is team day here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, but tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams. We will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. 
And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. Thank you.